Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. The nature of this sermon is for people who just love the Word. This is for Word lovers. You're going to enjoy this sermon if you're a lover of the Word. You know, somebody can say, yeah, even me, I love the Word. But what do you mean by you love the Word? Talking about people who sometimes sit in the Scriptures and such. People who read the Bible sometimes and ask themselves questions. I'm talking about people who love the Word. I'm not talking about people who just come to church to get a husband, get a car, get a job, I'm tired, things are strangling me in the night. You see, this is beyond that. So if you're there and you're that kind of person who just comes to the Word because of what you need, it will give you what you need. It will give you what you need. But I want, by the grace of God, to take you to a journey. It's going to make you fall in love with the Word and God's mind concerning the kingdom. Somebody shout, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our teaching will come from the Gospel of St. John, uh, the first chapter. And uh, if you have read that portion of Scripture, Jesus is speaking to people that should go serve with him. He's finding them, he's telling them, come, follow me. He gets to Cephas or Simon, son of Jonah, and then he gets Philip. And the rest of them, and he's telling them, do what? Follow me. In the 44th verse, the Bible says, Now Philip was at Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip finds a fellow called Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Was a question. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And then Philip tells him, Come and what? See. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. He sees him coming and he says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And I want you to underline that. We're going to come to that a bit later. Before Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, and thou art the King of Israel. Thou art the Son of God. Now he has realized that the guy he's dealing with is not a normal person. That you are the Son of God and the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I see thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than this. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of God. Now, let me start this way. Jesus has found his disciples and is calling them, Follow me, follow me, follow me. There's a work coming. And one Philip goes to Nathaniel, tells him, you know what? Much as they've told me to follow, we have found the Messiah. This was his friend. See? There's something there. There's something there. That even though God had called Philip, Philip did not feel that it was fulfilling that he was going to follow our master whom they have found and leave his friend behind. That's the the true attitude of Christianity. That's the true attitude of Christianity. You don't leave anyone behind when you know they need it. Somebody shout hallelujah. You don't leave anyone behind when you know they need it. So, Philip, like the true disciple and Christian that should be, he goes out to his brother Nathaniel and he tells him, we have found him 
whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote about. I have found something and you as my friend, I don't want you to miss it. You cannot say that somebody is your friend, but you cannot give them the message. Especially for those of you who are Christians. You have friends who are not born again, who have no relationship with God. You send videos with them. You laugh with them. You know, you eat food with them. You speak, you know, some of the most crazy things with them. When it comes to the word, you're not able to tell them. They are not your friends. If they were your friends, if they were truly your friends, you would want them in the kingdom. You would want them in heaven. You would want them to get a hold of what you got a hold of. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so it's important for you to be able to reach out to your people, your friends, and tell them, you know what? You cannot have a friend. I cannot have a friend around me whom I have not had the opportunity to witness to. It's not possible. It's not right. Anyway, so he calls his friend. Now, Nathaniel is like, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you say Jesus of Nazareth? So that means Nathaniel was cognizant of one who was to come. He was cognizant of one who was to come. And he knew that that fellow who is going to come, as spoken of by Moses and the prophets, is going to be a Messiah. He's going to be the Son of God. He's going to be the King of Kings. But when Philip is introducing Jesus to him, he tells him he is the Jesus of Nazareth. So Nathaniel is like, okay, I may not have any problem with Jesus. We all want to see this man. It seems in days past or years past in the relationship they had with Philip, they had a certain connection eh, that they had between each other and perhaps they were waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he says, yeah, okay, Jesus. But can any good come out of Nazareth? Can any good come out of Nazareth. Now, of course, if you have read, of course, about many preachers that have preached about this portion of Scripture, and many of them emphasize the place of the fact that in that time, Nazareth was a very poor city, was impoverished. And so they didn't expect anything to come. It was the ghetto of their time. It was one of the poorest places in Israel. So he's saying, can anything good come out of that ghetto? Can anything good come out of that poor place? Can anything good come out of that impoverished place? Can anything good come out of there? And they're right. But there's something so deep about this portion of scripture that when I saw it and the light went on, boom, I was like, oh my God. Paul calls them the depths of the riches of the revelation of the glory of Christ. Oh, he says the depths of the riches of the glory of Christ. The revelation of Christ. He says, unsearchable is his knowledge. From ages to ages, his judgments and his ways are far from finding out. Only he can give them to you. And that is what I want to give you tonight, that that portion of scripture is so powerful. Let me help you understand why it's powerful. When you read the gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, when you read those four gospels, you realize that everyone, like I said, writes from the direction that they're inspired of the Holy Spirit and from the angle they see God. You see? But John also has his uniqueness because of his revelation concerning Christ. He had a very unique revelation as well. Very unique revelation. Because of the fact that one that was bathed out of a certain relationship that he had with the Christ, he was a disciple whom Jesus loved, and love has its way of experience. It has its way of instruction. Somebody shout hallelujah. But even deeper than that, when you read John, the 21st chapter, the 25th verse. I want you to understand from where John writes from, okay? He says, and there also, this was among the last verses of his book or his gospel. He says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. This is John speaking. He says, if we were to write about everything we saw, we would write about everything we experienced with this man, if we were to write about the things that that man did, no book would be sufficient in itself. For if they were to be written, I suppose the whole world would be filled. In fact, the whole world would not contain the books that should be written about this man. That means that everybody had a revelation of who this man was and what they did. But when it comes to the vision of John, John saw things, had things, experienced things with the Christ that if he was given the opportunity to write, even the world would not contain. So that a man coming from that perspective who has so much to write about Jesus, who has so much to say about this man, 
is careful not to waste space, pages or letters. You see what I'm saying? So when John is writing, he's writing from that abundance of revelation. And he says, if I can just put it, you know, to the simplest way I could write, if I could conclude all of these things that I've seen for the reader to read, this is how I would write. You see, that is why the gospel of John has how many miracles? Seven. And seven, the number means what? Perfection. And each of those miracles represents a dimension of healing in the healing ministry. That's for ministers, especially, and hungry, hungry, hungry Christians. So, when you see him writing, he is not going to waste any space. He's going to take opportunity of every word and letter because he's limited in the time to write everything that he should write. You see? So, he carries the story of Philip talking to Nathaniel and that statement, can any good come out of Nazareth? That means that there's something so deep in there and I want to take you to a journey of exploration. Now, for those of us who have read the Old Testament or had the opportunity to read the Old Testament, we see that from time immemorial, God had spoken through his holy men and he sent prophetic utterances. Oracles were sent concerning the coming of Jesus Christ concerning the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And some of which I want to share with you before I build, you know, the picture that you need to see tonight. In Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, the fifth verse, the Bible says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. The Bible says, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Who are they speaking about? Jesus Christ. They're speaking about Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, the 11th chapter, remember, if you will underline up there in Jeremiah, he will raise unto David a righteous branch. Underline the word branch. In Isaiah 11, the first verse, the Bible says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now I want you to go back and emphasize that first verse. The Bible says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, let me explain this, because it's important. If you perhaps will get in the Amplified Version, he says that, and there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, that is David's father, and a branch out of his roots shall grow, and what? And bear. Now, let me explain this. All of us know that David was a king, right? The choice of God. Not so. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. And God establishes a covenant with a lineage of who? Of David and his descendants. Those that were to come after. So that kingship stays. But there was a time in history, if you will go back and study, where the kingship started to die. The place of kingship started to die in the lineage of David. As one, the divisions came through, especially that which began through Solomon. You know, divisions began from about that time. And all through descendant upon descendant, Israel was split and split and split, scattered and scattered and scattered until the concept of kingdom was no more. But you see, Isaiah says that in that time, when that whole concept is no more, it won't bear fruit or branches, the root and stem will stay. A certain foundation will stay. A certain pattern will stay within that lineage. And out of that particular stem, he says, out of the root of that particular stem, a rod will come out, a shoot will come out, and it will grow out from the roots of that stem which had been cut. So much as the kingdom mind and the whole experience of kings and kingdoms had decimated in that time, he's saying that after it is gone, the stem will not be cut, the root will not be cut, the foundation is still there. 
because I need to build, God says, I need to build something out of that which is broken. And it's out of that from those roots as though it looks like a cut stem. But God's saying its life and roots will be down there. And out of there, one day, a branch shall grow out of those roots. And now he's talking about who? Jesus Christ. So what is Jesus called? A branch. And it grows from a stem. You understand? Because it's cut. And it says, and out of that, roots shall grow from that stem. And then we shall see a branch that shall come through. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. They're talking about the person of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah is introducing Jesus as a branch. Isaiah is giving us Christ as a branch, a typification. So Jesus appears as a branch from the ages through the prophetic voices that came back in those days. Now, I hope you're following me. Now, in Matthew, the second chapter, the 23rd verse, as they're talking about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew 23, 23rd verse, it says, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets that he shall be called a Nazarene. <laughs> he came to pass that he dwelt in a city called Nazareth that he might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophets that he shall be called a Nazarene. That's where the mystery started unraveling because I looked through the Old Testament and nobody ever called Jesus a Nazarene. No prophet ever prophesied the Christ as a Nazarene. No prophet. So when they say that it should be fulfilled, as was spoken by the prophets, when did Jeremiah or Isaiah or any of the prophets who spoke in the Old Testament, when did they call Jesus a Nazarene? To a normal reader, they would think that that's a contradiction because they would say, why are you saying that it was spoken of the prophets which is not written? Or actually somebody could assume that perhaps it was written somewhere in one of those extra biblical texts. And perhaps it was not carried in the books that we have. Somebody can even say, no, Matthew is just confused. He's saying that prophets prophesied the Christ to come from Nazareth, but there's no proof that this man was to come from Nazareth. No, Matthew is not mistaken. Matthew has gotten the revelation. And this is the revelation, that when you study traditional Hebrew, you will realize that there is a word called Netzah. And the most important letters there is N, Z, and R, Netzah. And Netzah in the Hebrew means branch. And it's from Netzah that we get the word Nazareth. It's from Netzah that we get the word Nazareth. So what did the prophet say? The prophet said, that from the household of Jesse, a branch shall come. Jeremiah speaks of him as a branch. Isaiah speaks of him as a branch. When Matthew understands from the ancient texts as written by those that had come before about what the prophets had prophesied about this man, and then he notes that he is called a branch. The traditional Hebrew in him sees Netzah. And if it says Netzah, it can actually connect that Netzah means branch. That is why he said that now he dwells in a city called Nazareth or branch, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophets, that it shall be called a branch. Who has understood what I just said? Now, are you seeing that this is so deep? Because if we go back to Nathaniel's question, can any good come out of Nazareth? Actually, what Nathaniel is saying, can any good come out of a branch? Are you following what I'm saying? Can any good come out of a branch? Can any good come out of a branch? That's what Nathaniel is asking. Why? Because Nathaniel is looking at Nazareth as a physical place. He's looking at it as a ghetto, an impoverished place. Place of the fallen, the weak, the beggarly, and the lowest status of society. That's what? His physical eyes are seen. That's what, what the Lord sees. So Jesus patterns himself to live where? Because it's interesting, in the times of Isaiah, 
Nazareth was not existent. In the times of Jeremiah, Nazareth was not existent. Somebody woke up and called that place Nazareth. But they even did not know why they were calling it Nazareth because the Christ had not yet come and neither was it inspired anywhere through the scriptures by the prophets. So whoever called it Nazareth? Listen, when you study God and understand him, you will learn one important lesson that there are no coincidences when it comes to God. Everything is planned and calculated. He has the science of it. He has the biology of it. He has the mathematics of it. He is just that kind of brain. That's just how God is. And to figure him out is to be able to read and listen to what the Spirit is saying beyond what men are able to hear or what the Spirit has written beyond what men are able to read. When you understand God from that perspective, you'll be amazed that nothing is straightforward. Some of you will start questioning, why were you named what you were named? Why were you born on the day you were born? Why are you married to the person that you're married to? Why is your firstborn male or female? You'll start to see the pattern of God. You will read between everything. Some people say, oh, it's wrong to always read between the lines. When you are reading some evil or carnal, that's wrong. But when it comes to the way of God, it's just his nature. And perhaps you're saying people are reading between lines because we are created in his own image and nature, right? In his likeness. It's innate that we find ourselves reading between lines because it's just his nature. It's within. He does not create without a plan. When you understand this, you will never just build ministry. You'll never just put a conference. You'll just never theme it. You'll not just appoint people. You'll not just work with any good minister. You will not just look for a good worshiper to lead your choir. You will not appoint just this one guy because he has a muscle and therefore he's going to be the head of your security. You will not just appoint this woman because she works here, therefore she's going to be the head of your welfare. No, when you understand how patterned life is, you'll be careful about your life choices in appointing, in disappointing, in relationship, in the way you walk your life. You will not just make decisions because sometimes some liberties a representation of our immaturity if they're not aligned to truth and experience. Experience can only come when you understand the judgments of God through the things that he'll throw at you and the lessons that you will learn in those things. He says, when you were young, you went wherever you wanted. Yeah, there's a liberty in the fact that I can't go anywhere that I go. But that is not a liberty of designed for a child of God. That's a liberty that belongs to the immature. That's a liberty that belongs to the babe. It's not where God has called you. This is when you were young, you guardest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. When you shall be old, he says, you shall stretch forth your hands and another man shall guard thee and carry thee in places you will not. Sometimes when we talk about liberty, it's so dependent on where we are in our levels of maturity. There's a young man right now, 21. He's gone to the bar and he's wasting himself. And he says, yeah, according to the government, my age is above drinking age. So I am free to drink. But he's not free because he's going to waste his life. But he thinks that he's free. He's free to do anything that he wants. He's free to do any kind of crazy thing that he wants. Why? Because he thinks he's mature enough. So sometimes liberty is on the foundation of the judgments of the Spirit and our place of maturity. You realize that as you grow, you are as free as you're constrained. God is love. And the Bible says, and love what? Constraineth us. That's why he said in the next verse, because thus we judge. That means we carry the judgments of God. Your liberties will come constrained. The boundaries will become smaller even as you are free. But if you go that way and you allow God to entirely constrain you in the revelation of his judgments to allow you walk in the true liberty of the mature, what I call the wisdom of the just, it's amazing what your influence will be in this world. You will walk in things, you will do things you will function in a glory that every man would envy. 
But more than that, you have a place with God when you leave this body. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, back to what I'm trying to share with us tonight. And so, when Nathaniel is asking, can any good come out of Nazareth? God had named Nazareth through a certain man that we don't have a name for. And he had allowed Nazareth to be impoverished. He had allowed Nazareth to be inhabitable. He had allowed Nazareth to be a ghetto. But there's a reason why he wants it that way. Because he wants to bring something out. Like I always told you once, God is one of the most dramatic beings in a good way that I've ever met. That's how he writes his stories. Brethren, let us consider our calling. For not many were wise after the flesh. Not many of us were mighty after the flesh. Not many of us were noble after the flesh. And the Bible says he has chosen the foolish things of the world that he should confound the wise and he has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's just his way. His strength is made perfect in weakness. He gets an Abraham who is 100 years old and 90 years old, Sarah. And then he says, no, these are the ones that are going to give birth to children. That's just how God is. He works from the least expected places. He comes from the most unexpected realms and he functions in the least expected vessels. Do you know that people who have a problem with color, that they don't believe God can or should appear through a certain color? Do you know that people who have a problem that God is not appearing in a certain size? God is not appearing in a certain district? God is not appearing in a certain Christian umbrella? God is not appearing in a certain fellowship or network. God is not appearing in the family of a certain man of God, but is appearing through somebody who comes from nowhere, has no definition, has no identity with them. He cannot even connect. Paul, Paul could not speak. He even confesses it in his own books. He says for his letters, the Bible says, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. And then God gets a guy who cannot even speak right. And then he makes him as a master builder of the New Testament. Can any good come out of Nazareth? Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. He finds Moses a stutterer. A man who has not had the voice of God for 40 years. He's stammering. And then he tells this guy that much as you don't have the speech that is necessary, I shall put your words in another man. But if I am to choose, you're the spirit, you're the vessel that I've chosen to deliver the whole nation, the children of Israel, and rewrite their own story to see the mighty wonders and miracles that shall come after that. Can any good come out of Nazareth? The spies are going to spy on the land that the Lord has promised. And they send people there and they meet a prostitute. Rahab, of all, there should have been a righteous woman in there. There should have been a faithful wife in there. There should have been a virgin in there. But they enter a house of a harlot, a prostitute and they tell her, hide us. God has a destiny with you. Can any good come out of Nazareth? It's just his way. It's just his way. It's just his way. And the Bible tells us that Rahab is among the grandmothers from where this branch comes from. My God, this branch comes from histories of men that were so weak. This branch comes from histories of men and women that were contemptible. It came from the least expected people and the least expected places. Sometimes I enter rooms and somebody says, that's Apostle Grace. And people are like, you see? Why? Because they expect Apostle Grace to look like something. Are you hearing me? That is why I tell you, when you look like something, I pity you. God wants to give you something that you don't look like. Somebody shout hallelujah. God wants to work through you in a way that does not connect to your network, to your education, to your color, to your relationships, to your ethnicity. Listen, even if you don't have the right language, in stammering, in your stuttering, God can still ordain the deepest praise. Can any good come out of Nazareth? Some of you, you've already disqualified yourselves. Because when you look at yourself, say, ah, uh ah, -uh. <laughs> not me. Not me. How? How? Me? Apostle, me? Do you know how many things I've done? Do you know how many people I have killed? You could not have killed more than David. Somebody shout hallelujah. There is no man that is exempt from this grace. But even the rather now, 
It's been years of walking with God and I've come to this one conclusion that God comes from the least expected places. He uses the least expected people. He connects to the least expected individuals. The weakest things that you see, that is where God begins to work. It's where God begins to work. It's where God begins to work. Look at how nations have been drawn. How empires have been defined. You will see the weakest people on the top of those things, those places. God has ordained them deliberately. There's a child right now, he's walking the streets somewhere in the world. He's an orphan walking. He has no shoes on him. Nobody knows him. He's perhaps sleeping under a bridge. But the eyes of God are on that one boy. They are observing him every day. And there's that affirmation always saying that you're the one that I chose in spite of your background. Some of us were results of many things. Some were results of mistakes. Some were results of rape. Some were results of anything. It can come from anywhere. Some of us were results of illegitimate relationships. Some of us were bastards and born out of wedlock. But to God, it did not matter who and how. He had his eyes on you, beholding you from the day you were born in your mother's womb. He knew the family you were coming from was of witchcraft and sorcery. He knew your kind of people had an attitude. He knew them that they had their own issues. They were not as beautiful or good look. But God, but God, but God, can any good come out of Nazareth? Let me first answer Nathaniel. It is the way of God to build good from such places. It's the way of God to build good from such places. But even deeper, Nathaniel does not know that much as he questions, now you're going to love this, much as he questions the way of God because he does not understand how God functions, he is in the middle of not only divine purpose, but preordained oracles. He's somewhere in a prophet's mouth. He's in the middle of the perfect will of God. But the physical self does not know it. Zechariah, third chapter, the eighth verse. He says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, Thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, what did you call him? The branch. Hmm? For behold, listen, the stone that I've laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes, Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And the Bible says, and in that day in which iniquity is removed, by whom is he removing the iniquity? The branch, right? And in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree? Shall ye call every man and his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. When Philip goes to Nathaniel, Nathaniel is under a fig tree. Zechariah saw it, that a guy one day will be under a tree, and they are going to call him, and the branch is going to call him. Somebody shout hallelujah. That means Jesus doesn't need to tap Nathaniel to call him. Uh Uh-uh. There is a pattern of prophecy that is written, and Philip is just the connect bridge between the purposes of God to find a man under the vine because there shall be a man found under a fig tree one day. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the Bible says he shall take iniquity from that land in one day. Now this is so amazing. That one of the root words that defines iniquity or sin right is deceit. So Watch this. It's also the very word that means guile. So when Nathaniel walks to Jesus and Jesus beholds him and says, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Here is the mistake. 
He was not talking about Nathaniel. He was talking to Nathaniel. Who, who understood? He was not talking about Nathaniel. He was talking to Nathaniel because he was the man who knew no sin. You cannot tell me that Nathaniel was a perfect man. Are you seeing? So he says, behold the man of the Israelites in whom there is no guile. In whom there is no guile. So whether Nathaniel understood it or he didn't, you see? So when he says that, Nathaniel asks, where did you know me from? This is what I believe. I think when Jesus beholds Nathaniel, Nathaniel picks the word Israelite. And I think that's why he's asking, where did you know me from? I don't think there's any justification that makes Nathaniel with no guile, with no sin, with no deception in him. At least by scripture. But you could also argue and say, no, he was talking about Nathaniel. He could. That's my understanding, my knowledge in the mystery. So, <laughs> Jesus tells him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. When? When? Was it when he sat under the fig or through Zechariah? When Philip called thee, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. He's telling Nathaniel, you're in a place of doubt, but before you were even born, I knew that one day the branch which you doubt shall send a man. And when it sends a man, that day you shall be under a fig tree. Jesus did not just have an open vision that he's under a tree. Uh-uh. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He had seen it way before. And Nathaniel, even in the deepest doubt of the ways of God, is in the perfect plan of God's oracle as a fulfillment also. Do you know that some of the people who fight you are also part of a certain plan? That some of the people who doubt you, they are part of a certain plan. If you took time actually to study, you'll find them somewhere in scripture. But all things work together for good. To they that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Those that were ordained to mad slay you, they're there. Those that were ordained to speak evil about you, to backbite you, you know. Those that were there to hate you and criticize you wrongly. Those that were there to betray you and blackmail you, they were all somewhere. And God saw even your weaknesses. He also saw them and knew that you, you will mess up here, you'll mess up here, you'll mess up here. But before you even got to salvation, before you even got to this point of knowing me, I saw you under that fig. I saw you under that fig. I saw you under that fig. And so, again, because of Nathaniel's low vision, low place of sight, he cannot see the bigger picture, but at least it has come in his spirit. You see where he's fascinated from? <gasps> the guy knew I was under a fig tree. But that's not where Jesus is. So Nathaniel is like, oh my God, you are the son of God. You're the king of kings. You're the king of Israel. That is true. I believe you now. And Jesus said, oh, because I saw you under the tree. Directly translated, because I prophesied about you in Zechariah. And you didn't know. So you believe me because I saw you under a tree. Because we also have a generation that believes that a man is a prophet because he saw what they ate yesterday and he has their phone number in the spirit. But he said, greater things than these shall you see. So what many people don't ask themselves is what did John see when he was writing these things? What are you seeing now? He says, greater things than these shall you see. Greater things than these. He didn't say more things. He says greater things shall you see. Greater things shall you see. So he tells Nathaniel, you shall see. The Bible says heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In other words, there's a bigger vision going to come your way. Because that one, you might not find it in the prophetic or the law, 
But there are things that are coming your way. Greater things you're going to start to see. More than this which you see now. More than this that fascinates you. You are going to see greater things than you have ever read in the Bible. That's what it's saying. You're going to see greater exploits than you have ever read anywhere. We're walking in days where men are going to teach, where men are going to preach, where men are going to prophesy, where men are going to demystify. And it shall be said of them and women alike that this is greater in Revelation. The stem will stay. The roots will stay. That is the word of God. The branch is you. The vine now in the New Testament is not cut. It's growing. That's the beauty with the New Testament. He says, I'm the vine and ye are the branches. You know, ye are the branches. Some people just end on, for without me you can do nothing. But they don't imagine what they can do with him. They cannot imagine what they can do with him. He says, you shall bring forth much fruit. You do not limit how much fruit will come out of you. When he saw it with the eyes, divine eyes, he said, that fruit is much. Can't be counted. It's much. It's amazing what God can and is able to do through you. And the most humbling experience that he's not going to do it through the best they are in the world. If the most smartest people in class, by reason of being smart in class, translated to interpretation of scripture, then it would mean that the smartest people are the best interpreters of the Bible. We have people who are so smart that they've denied the very Lord and Savior who gave them life through education. They are submitted and yielding to fallen wisdom. Paul calls it wisdom that is brought to nothing. And they leave the true wisdom of God. But the Bible says that the world in its wisdom knew not God. In thinking that they were wise, they became fools because they did not know him. He says, for after that, the world through its wisdom knew him not. They did not know the wisdom of God. And it pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel to serve them that believe. But yet... It was in God's infinite plan to allow them to appear wise. So he would show them exactly who the wise are, who the greatest are. Greater things you shall do. Greater things you shall see. Greater things you shall hear. Greater days are ahead of you. God has greater plans than you. When Paul looks from heaven, claps his hands and says, go, that's it. Go. Peter says, of which salvation the prophets of old shared their hearts, revealed. They were receiving information. Left, right, and center. They inquired and searched diligently and prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or oh, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. And he testified beforehand to them the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And they continue asking, but this thing called Jesus, this glory of God, what is it? They searched and searched diligently. And the Bible says, and to whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, the Bible says, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by those who preach the gospel. Which things, the Bible says, the angels require or desire to enter into. They desire to look into. Even the angelics, when they see what's available for you, they admire you. When Elijah looks at you, he admires you. When Elisha looks at you, he admires your place. So why is this generation not walking the life greater than those prophets? This is a generation that should not clap hands when axes float. Greater. This is a generation that should not be shocked that a dead man has been raised. Because he said greater. Even the Christ says greater things shall you do because he saw. He saw what was going to come. Your father Abraham saw my day and he was glad. Now the man in that day says, "Uh uh-uh, I see greater days. So what would Abraham do to see your days in him? The continuation of that greatness of his life and power being demonstrated through the whole world. This is what I want to tell you. 
we're going to walk in anointings. We're going to walk in certain glories that are going to confound even the greatest scholars in the world. That day is come and it is now. And for a man or woman to understand this means to prepare your spirit. Don't pray like a man who is looking for food. Don't pray like a woman only who needs just a husband and that's it. Don't pray like a man or woman on mission. Pray like a man or woman on mission. Great days are ahead of us in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's just take some time and speak in tongues or in your language whichever language you have. Rida robo shara la bariri ku sara la bariri. Ribo zanda la bariri ku sara la bariri de bu sara. Ko barende le bu You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone make my spirit yield you alone my heart desire and I long to worship you come on speak another time You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. Hey, you alone are my heart's desire and I. As it deepens for water, as the deeper they go. Come and raise your voice wherever you want. Start to pray. Kabore mando robo zala bare de ba shata la 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 ba. Ribro do ko shinda la la bare de le bo sta. Rabado zire mando robo shata la de le bo. Rando ziba kabare le le bo sata la la ba. Rede ko shanda la bare de le bo sta bare de le bo. Rinda zobo zoko tere para le 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 mara da ko sha. Ma bara le 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 bo sha bara le le nda le le bo. Haza bara de kamba da de keshe de le ba. Zapa pre de le ke shita na manto robo rodo. Ribara de le ko sha la le 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 bo ra. Ma sabare de mo sha ta la le 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 bo ra. Ma ma de le 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 ma shoro bara de le le bo. Zekere de mara de le bo. Sala da la 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 ba. Zapa pro no robo ko shira la 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 le 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 bo. Zala da le 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 I want you more. Sala de 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 bo, sala de de bo, sala de 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 sala de 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 bo, de 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 sala de 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 bo, sala de 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 bo, sala de de bo, sala de de bo, sala de 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 bo, sala de 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 bo, sala Kashama de le le mando robo zala ba ba la ba. You alone, you alone are my shield, my shield to you. Hello, may my spirit yield. Hey, you alone, my shala la le le bo branda kora ba la le. So bala le 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 bo raba kusa la 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 ba shiboro lo lo bo. I thank you, O God, because Your word is working in our spirit. I decree upon every man and woman at the sound of my voice that may you enter the next realm of glory that God has ordained for our generation. May God anoint you. May God consecrate you. May God put something on you. 
greater than we have ever read in human history. Receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for the sick that they'll be healed. I pray for the bound that they'll be free. Mention a miracle you want to happen right now and receive it because it's happening in the name of Jesus. I thank God for your health. I thank God for your dreams. I thank God for your aspirations. Greater days are ahead of you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I pray for the minister. Tonight you're elevated. You're going to see your life walk in a glory like never before. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. If you have never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says there's no name by which any man is saved. He's the branch. Without him you have no life. No name is given among men whereby anybody can be or should be saved. Say that name of Jesus. And he's welcoming you tonight. He saw you even before you tuned in. And he chose you for salvation tonight. Just repeat these words after me. Say, Father, I thank you for the gift of Jesus tonight. I receive him as my personal Lord and Savior, as one who shed his blood for my sins and was raised for my glory. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.